Okay, change is a good thing. But we're going to see this in Psalm 73. We've got a man here, Asaph. He is a priest uh, of the tribe of Levi, probably at the time of King David or the time of Solomon, one of the men possibly in the uh, Levite tribe who had been mentored by Asaph. But nonetheless, he is a choir leader. He is writing psalms for worship. And worship and singing goes on continuously in the temple. It's not just a Sunday morning thing like we do. Um, Worship was going on 24-7. There was sacrifice going on constantly at the temple mount, mount, whether it was in the temple of meeting, uh, the tent, or whether it was under Solomon where a building was built. There was this constant worship and sacrifice going on. And so lots of music had to be written. Lots of psalms were written. And Asaph is giving us something from his heart that's very rich. And I believe uh, it has really helped me over the years. It was one of the first passages of Scripture that I memorized as a new Christian. A friend of mine, a different friend, had said, hey, just grab hold of this. Just memorize this. You're going to use it a lot. And I'm glad he did. And we'll, we'll look into that in a few moments. What I want to do is break this psalm. It's a long one, 28 verses. So we're going to break it into three sections. I'm just going to read one section at a time. So Psalm 73, and I'm reading the ESV, um, and we're going to go verses 1 through 16. Let me uh, read that. We have it up front there. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, this is Asaph speaking, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat or well-fed and sleek. They are not in trouble as others. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind, and therefore pride becomes their necklace." and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them, and they find no fault in them. They, they, and they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. They always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. But if I had said, I will speak thus, then I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, It seemed to me a wearisome task. It's a whole mouthful here. We're not going to be able to break it all apart, but I want to help you see the kind of flow of what's going on here with Asaph. Here's a whole life connected to leading choirs of singing the praises of God. He's a part of this awesome enterprise of giving God continuous praise and glory. I mean, we were doing it for just 15 minutes here, 20 minutes with singing, The lyrics are wonderful. There's just biblical truth coursing through what we were just singing. You know, you're just lifting your hands, your heart to God because it's what you and I were made for, praise, giving glory to God. And here, that's going on 24-7 in Israel at this time for the Jews. And Asaph has the privilege of expressing from his personal experience his walk with God. But in this situation... He's telling us about something that has happened in his life, and God used it as a means of growing him. Change. Okay, that's what it's about. Change, growing, becoming more like Christ. And here's what's happening to this guy. Verse 1, he's saying, yes, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, meaning those who are trusting in the righteousness that God holds. And for a Jew at that time, around 1000 BC, how could could a Jewish person become right with God, well, we know that the New Testament says they had to be looking ahead to a Messiah. They had to be trusting that Jehovah God would be just and that he would provide a messianic hope for them. Because as much as they tried in temple worship, as much as they tried to to keep the law of God, they knew they still had struggles. They still messed up. They were still sinners. And so annually, every year, 
What happened in the Holy of Holies in the temple? It would be the day of Yom Kippur, the the day of atonement, when God would say, enough of your sin. The only way I'm going to hold back my justice against you is I'm going to have the high priest slay a spotless lamb on your behalf, and the blood is going to be sprinkled on the altar and the doorposts, and I will relent my justice against you for another year, but only because that blood is being shed. Now, a Jew at the time of David, Asaph, Solomon, recognizes this is God's provision. This is the only way our sin can really be dealt with. We try our best to keep rules and standards. We do the dietary laws. We keep the judicial laws here in the land. As a nation, we trust our leaders as Israel, and yet God is saying it's not enough. All of this just points to my holiness and your unholiness. And you're still without hope, but there's blood that's going to be shed every year for you. And it's pointing to what you and I know now was the everlasting covenant, the once for all blood that was shed by Jesus Christ on the cross on Calvary, 33 AD. We can look back and we can see what they only saw in part. We look back and we see the whole picture and it's beautiful. We just sang about that picture, didn't we? Now, Here's this just God, verse 1, that uh, Asaph is in agreement with. There's nothing like him. Those who are pure in heart, God is good to them. But then going on with verse 2, here's the issue. But there's a problem. Something has happened. No fault of God. I am the problem, Asaph is saying. Let me tell you about the process of change that has to go on in us, Asaph is saying. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Okay, and we're not going to read it yet, but I'll just give you a little hint. Verses 21 and 22 also describe part of that. He's just saying that my soul became embittered. I was pricked in my heart. I acted brutishly and ignorant. I was just like a beast toward God. Okay, so whatever happened, whether it was a trial that came upon Asaph and he reacted wrongly, or whether it's something Asaph did himself, he just sinned big time against God and played his game with God. Whatever happened, he's telling us, here's what goes on when we play games with God. Here's what goes on when we distance ourselves from him. And so what we just read, verses 3 through 16, describe where our natural thinking is where our basic thinking, our tendency to not to walk away from God and do our own thinking, this is how we start observing life. This is how we start seeing everything going on around us. Now, it's a painful place to look, but my friends, I hope you were able to see a little bit of your own thinking there. And that's my goal, is to help you see that what we we watched in verse 3 through 16 is really where you and I digress a lot of times in our daily walk with Jesus. We go back to the old defaults, the old ways of thinking, and we stay there for a while. We interpret circumstances, situations in our life through the old lens, and we get ourselves way off. Now, don't worry. The second and third part of this psalm really get us going where we need to go. But we want to just rest here for a few minutes and just think about what, what Asaph is saying. I messed up. I walked away from God. I was disfellowshipped from him, and look where my mind went. Look how I started thinking about everything going on around me. Let's look at a few of those verses. 17 through, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 3 through 16. Look at verse 3. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Okay, you ever done that? (laughs) You're driving a fairly new car and you're pretty happy with it. And then you look over and there's even a newer car with a little bit more equipment on it and a little nicer decked out. And you kind of go, man, I wish I would have waited a year and gotten that one. That's even a nicer model. Wow, you know. Okay, oh, come on. Everybody has their little daydreams. Come on. What he's saying is there's this envy that we have. There's a prosperity that we see and we interpret it in ways that make us want more, make us not content with what God has given me already. Uh, Verse 4, there's no pangs until death. They don't have any real problems. You know, death, yeah, death is ugly and nobody wants to be at the side of somebody dying. But okay, up until that point, they had a pretty nice life. Wow. 
There's no pangs in their death. Their bodies are well fed. They're sleek, you know. They, they take care of themselves. We've had some of the nicest stuff, you know, enjoy good things. Yeah, isn't that great life? That's a great life we have here in America. They are, there are, they are not in trouble, verse 5, as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Hmm. Okay, now we know that's not true because we're Christians and we know that's not true, but what happens when we get off track? What happens when we become envious? What happens when we're discontent with God's kindness in our life? We want something more. We start looking at others and we say, man, alive. I kind of wish I had what they had. I'm in this mess right here. I don't have enough money. I don't have a situation I'm happy with. So we start becoming envious and we, we quietly look at what others have and it's more than us. We don't get uh, what we really should deserve. But he says, verse 6, their pride is their necklace. You know, they, their boast is something they wear around them. It's, it's obvious. You know, hey, you know, this guy's got it and he's enjoying it. Hey, you got it? Flaunt it. You know, that's our culture, isn't it? Violence covers them as a garment. Now, they might not outwardly look like a violent person, but it's all through their person. You know, you cross somebody and immediately you're uptight. You're, you're looking at that individual and they're now public enemy number one. Oh, you might still be smiling at them, but in your heart, you're fed up with them. You wish they were a non-person. You've basically killed them, okay? Jesus said, if you say fool, even in your heart towards somebody, you've murdered them. Whoa. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here that our old way of thinking used to do that is really contra to God. But our minds dip there a lot. Their eyes swell out through fatness, verse 7. Their hearts overflow with follies, with foolishness. Okay, in their heart, you and I can't get there, but if, if we were like God and we could read what was on the heart, it's a lot of foolishness. They just make it look good on the outside. They scoff, verse 8. They speak with malice. Oh, I was just joking. Cool, man. <laughs> no, I wasn't joking. <laughs> I meant it. You look stupid in that outfit. You know. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you that. We just joke about it. Okay, this is, the, this is the way things go in the culture outside of Christ. They loftily threaten oppression. Hey, the person with the bigger heap wins. The person who's a little bit smarter gets on top. In all sorts of ways, I'm sure you guys that are in a command, you see this happening all the time. You see these kind of games being played. They set their mouths against the heavens. Now here, what he's saying is, basically a person is saying, is there really a God up there? <laughs> Come on. You know, I've got everything here. I'm enjoying life. You're telling me that there's this God that I have to owe to? <laughs> okay, whatever. The spirit, huh? There's something up there. Their tongue struts through the earth. No, I just know terra firma. I know this land. I know where I'm living. And I've got a good grasp of it. And I'm enjoying it. So if you're telling me about this God that can't be seen, can't be proven, can't be verified, you're fine. You can have him. Okay, and that's how non-Christian thinking goes, doesn't it? Therefore, his people turn back to them. They find no fault in them. Humanistic thinking here on this earth, people that are created in God's image, humanistic thinking can only be stuck in its circuitous thinking. This cycle of, well... Everybody else thinks this way, so okay, if they think it, well, it must be right, you know, hey, I'm not going to be stupid. We find no fault in these people. You see, we're all playing this game. We're all saying, hey, you know, no harm, no foul. If it doesn't hurt, it's cool, no big deal. We're acting like there's no set of standards outside of us, no morality that comes into our life and says, no, you may not think this, you may not act this way, you may not do this. We don't want that. That kind of makes, that crimps our day, doesn't it? That's how the world thinks. Uh, and we just go on with a couple other things. Um, the Spirit. How can God know? Verse 11. They say, how can God know? He's a spirit. He doesn't have a real body. How can he know what it's like to feel what we feel here on earth? Well, anyway, he just goes on. And he says, these are the wicked. They are at ease. They increase in their riches. And then verse 13. 
you know, after my personal sense of duty of everything I've been doing, I've been trying to walk in the right ways. I'm trying to have clean living. And look what it gets me. In vain, I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I, I'm stricken. I'm going through this trial. Every day I get rebuked by this pain or by this issue that I'm experiencing. And yet for them, they don't have to pay for anything. I feel like I'm the one paying for stuff. If I had said this, I will speak this way, then I would have betrayed the generation of your children, Lord, verse 15. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me an overwhelming, wearisome task. What he's saying is he's been doing a lot of thinking in his mind and he's gotten tired of it. Because it is tiring, isn't it? When we get into our own mind and we do our own thinking and we make our comparisons and our judgments or we feel abused or misused or misunderstood, we spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves, don't we? We might not be voicing it, but the mind is very active doing that self-talk creating that space to feel a little bit better for ourselves, And that's what Asaph is getting at. He said, this is how the world thinks. This is how you and I were taught by the world to think. And this is that subtle subtext of thinking that goes on all the time that even for we as Christians who are now born again, Asaph, who was trusting in the righteousness of Messiah to come, he was looking ahead to a Redeemer, He had fallen back, and he started thinking in that tiresome, wearisome way like the world does. When I tried to make meaning with my own sense of self, in my own natural way of thinking, of putting things together, I realize it's completely wrong. I realize that kind of thinking that comes from self, that tries to evaluate life on my own, that thinking is worthless. I need help from outside of me to make sense of life. Now let's look at the next section, verses 17 through 24. This next section. So the first one, human thinking is naturally wrong. We'll just say that. If you're taking notes, verses 1 through 16, human thinking is naturally wrong. And Asaph points that out real clearly for us. The second point, though, verses 17 through 24, the cross is the proper focus for thinking. The cross is the proper focus for thinking. 17 through 24. Let's read that now. Now If we got it up there, if we can get it. Verses 17 through 24. There we go. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Okay, this is like a pivotal verse here. Very, very important. I was doing all this thinking. It was wearisome. I was thinking like the world thinks. I digressed until I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Verse 18, truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. They're swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered. When I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, Lord, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Now, why do I say in my second point here, the cross is the proper focus for our thinking? Hopefully you see in these verses a picture of the cross. You recognize first, in uh, verse 17, we have this suffering and dying that is absolutely essential. Where does suffering and dying happen? At the sanctuary. Remember what happened in Israel. The cultic life of Israel revolved around the Temple Mount. So 24-7, there's some kind of sacrifice, there's some kind of offering going on all the time. Blood, animals dying, okay, Various grain offerings, all these kinds of offerings going on all the time. And then continuous praise going on through the, with the Levite priests. Remember, a whole tribe of the nation was dedicated to just serving religious service at the temple. So it was a big thing. 
So here in verse 17, we got this idea of, of suffering has to happen. Dying has to happen in order for people to have a right relationship with God. And then verse 24, afterward you will receive me to glory. The idea is you will bring me up to glory. Suffering, dying, and raising. This is the picture of the cross. This is what Jesus is all about. We know that 2,000 years later, 1,000 years later, Jesus came and exactly that very thing, the end of his mission was to give himself over to be suffer, to die, and then to be lifted on the third day by the Father, to be raised. So there's something awesome about the cross focus that Asaph finally brings us to here. Looking at verse 17, until I went into that sanctuary place, uh, sanctuary. Jesus himself in John chapter 2 spoke about a sanctuary. What did he say? Remember when the Pharisees heard him and they just scratched their head? What in the world is he talking about? He said, if you destroy this sanctuary in three days, I will raise it up. Now, who was he talking about? What was he talking about? They thought, of course, he was talking about a building or tents, depending on, you know, the Early, with David, it was tents. With Solomon, it was a building. At the time of Jesus, it's the Temple Mount rebuilt. Oh, so he's going to rebuild this building in three days? He's crazy. But what does the next verse say, 2021? It says, he was speaking of sanctuary as his own body. His body is a sanctuary. You people kill me. You hoist me on a cross. You leave me in a tomb. You think my flesh is going to stink and die, and instead the Father will raise me on the third day. And that's the message of the cross. That's the message of hope that you and I have got to hold on to, that Asaph had to get back to because he was ready to fall apart. He had lost hope. He says, I was brutish and ignorant, verse 22. I was making meaning on my own rather than conforming my thinking to your thoughts, God. See, this is where we go when we digress. And we can do this just in five minutes in a given day. We get jealous about something. We get unhappy about something. We replay a tape from years ago. Tape, I'm using the old signet. Yeah, maybe I'm talking about eight-track tapes or cassette tapes. Okay, I got a few years. I... I, I let me have it here. So we're replaying a scene from before, and we keep replaying it. But how do we replay it? Through our own grid, through our own observation, through how we felt when it happened to us. We, we formulate in people's words what we think they meant. We give a little tone, a little extra expression to their words. Maybe it was years ago. I remember my dad, it was just famous in my mind, um, he asked me to go do something down in the basement of our house, and I had some pliers, and I went to go do something, and I forgot why I had the pliers. And I started messing with them, and I went out to my bike, and I fixed something and all that. I came back, and you know, an hour or two later, he comes, and it was the water shut off in our, in our basement. It had been dripping, and you know, he didn't want to repack the thing. I'm telling you how old we are. We used to have packing in valves, okay? And he didn't want to repack it, so we just had to keep tightening it down. I didn't tighten the thing down. He, he finally goes, why didn't you do it? I said, I forgot. I'm sorry. And he said, don't ask a boy to do a man's job. And he just shook his head and walked off. Well, that stuck with me. Don't ask a boy to do a man's job. It just cut me to the quick. That was it. And I thought of that for years, you know. So I was always trying to kind of push myself up and show dad that, hey, I didn't screw up here, dad. Look, I did that for you, didn't I? And I took the trash out for you, and you didn't ask me to, and, you know, these little games that we play. What I'm getting at is, my friends, our life is made up of this kind of stuff. All kinds of things that have gone on in our lives from early on, and they have created in us this way of thinking, of looking at life, this way of reacting to people, of responding, this way of hoping or not hoping. Okay, we're a mixture of all this stuff. And Asaph is reminding us, that if we digress and we think those old ways, we are brutish. 
We're just like an animal. We're not really morally the person God made us to be. We're just kind of acting like an animal. Instinct, you know? Animals go by instinct. Hunger, so what does the animal do? Lash out, go kill something, eat, okay? There's no moral idea about it. Just by instinct, they go and eat. Whereas you and I hopefully have a moral compass that says, I may not go kill something to eat right, right now. I've got to give some thinking to this, you know. I'm not going to go punch somebody to go get their food out of their hand because I'm hungry. Okay, we're moral beings. We've been made by God to act morally, to act within parameters, within his rules. And that's a good thing for us. <clears throat> okay, and then finally... Looking at the cross, this godly person rehearses the cross. This Asaph priest, he's saying all humanity must face justice for it's God, it's, it's God who's awesome, it's man who's independent. So he's saying, uh, I, was a beast like, I was like a beast before you, but instead, Father, I'm actually continually before you. You're going to guide me by your counsel. You're going to receive me to glory. So he's doing what he's got to do, what you and I have got to do. We've got to change the talk. We've got to change the self-talk. We've got to go, okay, wait a minute. That might be as it appears to the world, but I'm not going to think that way. God, I'm going to choose to think through the lens of your cross. I'm going to look at life the way you look at it. And that's Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 where Paul tells us that if we're going to walk with Jesus, we are going to have to suffer like Jesus suffered. It has nothing to do with whether we're a Christian or not. It's just that we're going to go through a life that is going to have suffering. It could just be being older and losing our hair, <laughs> getting skin cancers or get whatever. Okay, we're going to go through some suffering. But are we going to go through every suffering in the power of Jesus? connected to him as our elder brother who loves us and says, it's okay, Ted, it's part of the fall. I was on earth too, and I grew from a young boy to 33 years old. I saw the process of aging happen. He didn't have to lose his hair like I do, but okay. He understands. He was human, just like us. We're all going to experience similar things, but God says, beyond this body, there's something much greater. Philippians 3.10, we're going to suffer. We're even going to have to die to dreams, die to our hopes, die to that promo that I thought I so desperately needed, but more than that, I earned, and they overlooked me. How could that be? Okay, we've got to die to things if we're in Christ because he knows there's something better for us. And then wait for him to lift us up. Wait for him to resurrect us and bring us to the place he wants us to be. Paul tells us that in Philippians chapter 3, that that is the process of the Christian life day by day. Well, going on then, let's look at the third point that I want us to see, verses 25 through 28. Cross-focused change is our true refuge. Cross-focused change. So we're talking about the lens of the cross of Jesus. Cross-focused change is our refuge and our true story to tell. It's a big mouthful here, sorry, but if you're writing notes, because I want you to see that in, this, in these verses, our true story to tell. Let's read verses 25 through 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. This is a passage that I was challenged to, to memorize as a new believer. It's really it's really pulled me out of some of those sloughs of despond over the years. It's really reminded me of what my Savior had to do when he truly went through that deep place on my behalf, and I've found comfort with him. Okay, so here's this proclamation. Cross-focused change is our true refuge. Who do I have in heaven but you? There's nothing here on earth for me. 
People who even say they're for me, well, they might be, but they eventually they're going to kind of lose steam too. The people that are closest to us some of the times really let us down. But there is one. <laughs> He's called refuge. He's called hope. He's called savior. He's called redeemer. And so I'm coming to the point in my life where there's nothing on earth that really matters. All that stuff in verses 3 through 16. Sleek, well put together, having what we need, proud of all the stuff we've got, the reputation we've got, all that kind of thinking doesn't work. That stuff I've tasted doesn't satisfy. My flesh and my heart will fail. What he's getting at is change is not going to stop. My heart and my flesh, they might fail me, okay, and they will. People will fail me. My own body is going to fail me. My heart that says, I want you, God, is going to let him down a lot of times, even let down the people that we love with stupid things we think or do or say. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. God is my portion forever. He's all I need. I don't need a lot, but I need Him. If I don't have Him, I have nothing. And again, those are nice Sunday words to hear and to read in a psalm. But come tomorrow or come this evening, is He going to be my portion? Is He enough? Or am I going to dip into the old way? Verses 3 through 16. Am I going to dip in and protect myself? Am I going to dip in with a little sarcastic snipe at somebody who is just bugging me? Am I going to get a little angry with my child and put a little extra tone in my voice so they get it and they don't bug me again? Okay, where am I going to go when I have opportunity to go to my refuge, to the one who I desire more than anything else? Hopefully, this is where we're going to be. The cross tells us that there is a horrible judgment, verse 27. There is an end to everyone who is unfaithful to Jehovah. So there is a horrible judgment. And just as the Father had to do to Jesus in our place, those three horrible dark hours when he was suffering on the cross, the Father had to justly sentence his Son to judgment for sin. So everyone who's unfaithful is going to suffer judgment. And anybody who trusts in Jesus, instead of having to suffer judgment, he sent it all on his son instead. That's the message of the cross. That's true Christianity. You and I don't get what we deserve. Whoa, we're wretched sinners. We play the game. All that stuff in verse 3 through 16, if we're going to be honest and we take time and we just slow it down a little bit, that stuff's true about us. We've thought all those kinds of thoughts. And we still sometimes do. But what's true is that there was one who took the hit three hours, made absolute judgment by the Father for our sin. It's amazing, amazing stuff. Final judgment for all humankind, all instead who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus will be able to do exactly what verse 28 says. But as for me, okay, God, I'm in circumstances that are not exciting today. I'm not really thrilled with what's going on right now. But as for me, it's good for me to be near you, God. I've made you the Lord God, my refuge. I've called on you. I have not run to myself for refuge. You see what Asaph's getting at? I have a tendency to always run back to me for refuge. Me to fix situations. Me to get my thinking. And instead, I've run to you, Jehovah Jesus, my refuge. So that, what's the purpose clause? My life, my words tell of God and his good works. That's what it's about. Our life is becoming this living picture of God and His goodness, His redeeming work. Okay, two points of application. First of all, all humans are meaning makers and we tell His story. 
Every one of us makes meaning out of life. We're either doing verses 3 through 16 or we're doing what verse 17 says. We're looking at the sanctuary. We're getting our lens focused on the cross. And we're saying, okay, it's not sweet and simple. This dying, suffering, dying, and raising is not the easiest thing, but it's the only thing. It's my only way to live now, God. Okay, we're doing one or the other. We're meaning makers. Every circumstance that comes at us, every situation you read about, conversations you hear, stuff that you're playing from way back years ago, like, son, you know, don't give a boy to do a man's job. Okay, if I play that again, I'm making meaning, aren't I? And I'm deciding what it's like to feel hurt and unloved by my dad and how unfair that was. And I'll never do that to my kids again. Uh Uh-uh, never say that word to my kids. Guess who tried to shame his three daughters? I didn't say a man, but okay, sweetheart, you know, you're just going to have to do better. Mommy does a lot better. You know, you're going to have to be like mommy. I played that game, didn't I? Did the same thing. We're meaning makers. And the issue is, what are we going to use? What lens are we going to use to make meaning in my life? If somebody hurts me, (laughs) what's the meaning that I'm going to make out of that? Maybe I feel offended, but I have to step toward that situation and I have to do what Jesus gives me the power to do. I have to see it his way. I have to focus it his way. And whatever I have to do in a godly way to see it and make it right, I need to do that. We're all meaning makers. From our earliest days, my friends, you and I have cobbled together our own patterns of thinking and responding to life that came at us. Our family of origin had great influence on us, and our culture just throws more into the mix. But none of us were neutral. Oh, we might think we were neutral when that was happening. Oh, I had an alcoholic sister, you know, older sister who kept trying to get me to drink, or I had a you know, whatever. Okay, we we can look at circumstances and say they were not nice. They were ugly. But ultimately, God is calling each of us to say, I am responsible for making the meaning that I am presently dealing with right now. I interpreted those things. I'm the one that made decisions. I'm the one that defended myself. I'm the one that created those patterns. Now I'm not stuck with that mess, praise God, because I have the lens of the cross where Jesus says, I've come, I've died for you. I've come to transform you. I want your thinking to change. I want you to have liberty and freedom. That's why we're here today. We're not home, sitting there just waiting for Monday to come. No, we're here saying God needs to be worshiped because he's the reservoir of glory I want to give. He's the one who's praiseworthy. He's the one who's freed me and liberated me and made me his child. I love to be with God and with his people. Okay, we're different because of his work. So my point here is Christians must be changing daily. We must be letting God's word, we must be letting the Bible and the Holy Spirit working us over all the time so that that change is good stuff. So I can ask questions of, why did I just think that? Why did I just say that? Why did I not go do that? Why am I longing for that? I can say, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Thank you. Thank you for Calvary, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit, for working in my heart so that we will be telling his story of redemption, of change. Our life will be telling the story that Asaph says in verse 28, I'm going to be telling all his works. And then one second point of application, I'll just cut it here. Change must happen, okay? It must happen. It is the way of the Christian life. And as I've illustrated, it's, we're going to be thinking one way or the other. God is good to Israel, verse 1. God really cares about those whose hearts are pure through Jesus. Because verse 20, 27, my flesh and my heart will fail, but the strength of my heart, my portion forever, is God alone. Okay? And you and I 
to be changed have to just be constantly professing this stuff. We've got to be constantly hearing it, being around people. That's why I'm going to put a plug in for our missional community groups and our DNA groups because we're working with brothers and sisters who say, I'm doing the same thing. I, I want to be talking Jesus and I want to be around people who are talking Jesus because I'm in the world all week long and we're not talking Jesus there. I've got to be making him much more real in my life. We've got to be around the people of God. We've got to be in the Word. Okay, so cross-focused living is actively speaking to our hearts, saying in our heart, I am with Jesus. He cares. He's already at the Father's right hand. He's speaking for me. I'm loved. I'm not alone. We've got to preach this stuff to our heart. That's what Asaph started doing. And look at the change that it did in him. Finally, you think of the words of the song that we just sang. A beautiful name. What a beautiful name is Jesus. A powerful name. What's going on with that song? We're just taking this one name, Jesus, Jehovah, salvation, Jehovah, our Savior, and we're just thinking of all the facets of that beautiful name. He's wonderful. He's powerful. His love is greater. There's nothing that can separate me from his love. He's my king. Nothing will ever stand against me with him at my side. He's my savior. He's my God. I will worship him alone. Brothers and sisters, this is the stuff of the the life of change. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. It's going to happen every day, hopefully, in our lives. But it's the best thing for us because what's it going to net? More like Christ. That's what we want. Amen? Amen. Well, if you've been hearing this and this whole idea of change is like, okay, I get it. Life does change. I just ask you this question. Are you ready for the most important change of your life? Are you standing on the outside watching all this Christian stuff? Are you willing to make the next step, which is the biggest change that will ever happen in your life, to come to a point where you say, Jesus, I need you so much. Would you save me from my sin? That's the change you've got to reckon with, my friend. And if you're here today and you're kind of on the edge looking at it all, I urge you, come on, step in. Admit you're a sinner. Admit you need a Savior. That's the most important step because then he's got open arms. He says, I'm ready. I'll take you. I'll make you my child. Change is a good thing, my friend. Be ready. Come to Jesus for that real change you need desperately. You can pray that quietly in your heart. You can talk to any of us after the service here today. We'd love to help you with that. Would you pray with me as we close? Thank you, Father, for just giving us this word together from Psalm 73. And we proclaim with Asaph, whom do we have in heaven but you? And really, there is nothing on earth we desire. Yeah, we play our games, Father. We admit it. We confess it. But really, the bottom story is you are everything. Oh, Lord, you have become our refuge. And our goal is to love you so much that our lives tell your works. God, would you help us to be that people this week as we leave here today? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.